For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. The Pyramids of Egypt are probably the most well-known ancient monuments in the world. Most people are familiar with the three on the Giza Plateau. But did you know there are well over a hundred pyramids that have been found in Egypt? On this trip, we will be investigating many of them and the secrets they hold. But today, our mission is to look into the origins of the pyramids, how they came to be. And we'll be learning a lot about the Old Kingdom and its capital city along the way, as we visit the amazing ruins of Memphis and Saqqara. <laughs> Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide, a helping hand for visiting historic places. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how best to enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Natalie and me on our trek through Egypt homeland of the ancient Egyptians, Kushites, Libyans, Asiatics, and Greeks. Come on, let's go. Perhaps you know NEXT, who has a YouTube channel of his own. If you like Egyptian antiquities, give him a sub. He hooked us up with a good deal at the Giza Pyramids Guest House in Giza, within walking distance of the pyramids there. We stayed there for five days. If you don't want to spend a lot and you don't mind having to ask for bathroom tissue and towels, Giza Pyramids Guest House is a great choice. It's clean, comfortable, and, as the name suggests, has a great view of the pyramids. The guest house provides a tasty, complimentary breakfast as well. And the proprietor offers camel tours at Giza, if you want one. But on our first day, we did not go see the Giza Pyramids. No, our destinations were a short drive to the south. First, the Mitrahina Open Air Museum, and then the fabulous, sprawling archaeological site of Saqqara. Now, welcome to Cairo. It's uh, traffic. Ironically, but understandably, the necropolises of this area, that is, the great cemeteries, have survived the ravages of time better than the city that they once sat next to. And the city I'm talking about is the ancient Egyptian capital known as Menefer, or Manf in later times. You probably know it better by its Greek name, Memphis. Today, the heart of the city is in the village of Mitrahina. We wanted to show you the remains of the city first before we show you the cemeteries. And that won't take much time because there isn't much of the ancient city left. The place to go see these remains, however, is the Mitrahina Open Air Museum. The museum costs 80 Egyptian pounds for entry, which translates to $2.60 in American money. It takes about an hour to see everything. But first, we need to go see the Statue oh, of Francis. Oh, look at that! Oh, look at the face! Oh, Sorry. we gotta go in here. <laughs> it's so cool. It's, it's, it's massive. I see a giant head in here. Who's that fellow with us? That's Ehab, our local guide. He knows every archaeological site around Cairo like the back of his hand. And he is very knowledgeable about ancient Egyptian art. If you're in the area, you would do well to choose him as your guide. Info below the video. This colossal statue of Ramses II was discovered lying in a pool of water in 1821. Hence the damage on the bottom. But it was not successfully moved until 1887. Ramses II, or Ramses the Great as he is sometimes called, 
as you may know, was one of the most renowned pharaohs to rule Egypt. And we have more surviving statues of him than any other king. And here, you can, if you look to the ear, you can see the person for the earrings. Oh yeah. He used to yeah. wear uh, earrings. If we look to the headdress, you can see uh, a fake uh, beard that attached to the headdress here. And he had the double crown of our lower Egypt and the cobras protecting his forehead. Fantastic. He reigned during the 19th dynasty, which was the time of the new kingdom. Some of his statuary was appropriated by him from earlier kings, but he has many original monuments too. This one is original. You can tell not only from the fact that there's no evidence of tampering, but also because Ramses had a distinct look in his depictions. A prominent nose set in a rounded face with high cheekbones, wide arched eyebrows, slightly bulging almond-shaped eyes, fleshy lips, a small square chin, and a slight smile. Once you get to know him, you will easily recognize him. But do not think this is how he really looked. This was an approved portrayal and was intended to be idealistic. Indeed, even when he was old, his depictions remained youthful. If you look here, this is the sword, and this is uh, a, a military arm form that is showing you he's ready for a battle. That's how he stands. Oh, like yeah, that. yeah, with and the one can, leg forward. And you can yeah. see the two stamps. Each stamp be carrying a different cartouche of him, one on oh, yeah. the left side, one on the right side. Think about the work that went into this. It's made of limestone, which is relatively easy to carve, but still, this was a huge undertaking. It no doubt needed a gang of workers to finish it in a reasonable amount of time, which may have been years. One thing the ancients had more of than we have is patience and persistence. They would have used stone tools and crushed stone abrasives. The finished work is so well done, it must have been performed by master sculptors. It is not only smooth to the touch, but the representation of the subtle aspects of the human anatomy is exquisite. No factory machine could achieve such supreme craftsmanship. This can only have been done by hand, the careful hand of professionals. Uh, offering table? And if we look a little bit here, you're gonna see it, it's so smooth in this side. That's from the knife. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. The knife and the butt goes from here. And this is uh, uh, Ooh, look at this still, s this is uh, very smooth here. Yeah. It's got some of the... That's, that's how it used to be, all the limestone back in the day goldy color like that yeah when it shine after they finish and they carve everything so when the sun reflect in it you can see a little bit but if you go back in the day it used to be like so shiny that a goldy color that you're gonna see well yeah mm -hmm. it's same like as the the pyramids of giza legends say that menefer memphis was first established at the very beginning of egyptian dynastic history yes dynasty one by the famed uniter of Upper and Lower Egypt, Narmer, who reigned around 3000 BCE, give or take a century. We know by the time of the Old Kingdom, dynasties three to six, it most certainly was the capital, and was so for part of the country in the first intermediate period that followed. Even when the capital was relocated later, it remained an important administrative center. Memphis sat on a floodplain on the western side of the Nile, and it was right at the entrance to the delta if you were traveling northward. So no southern army could take the delta without going through Memphis first. The patron deity of Memphis was Ptah, the god of craftsmanship and therefore creation. He was probably a local god to begin with, but the importance of Memphis ensured that Ptah would become popularly worshipped throughout the country. So here we got Ramses, uh, and Ta, and then again, Ramses and Ta. Oh, this is Ramses, okay. okay, with the crown of Lower Egypt. Nice. This is the god Ta. Right? And then, then the opposite, god Ta again, faced by Ramses, wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. Here's a little known fact you may be interested in. There was a major temple here dedicated to Ptah, 
which went by the name Hetkapta, meaning enclosure of the Ka soul of Pta. Well, later on the Greeks heard this name and rendered it in their own language as Aegyptos, a word that the Romans picked up and used for the region. And from their usage, we get the English word Egypt. We are in the great enclosure to the Temple of Ptah, built by Ramses II, or what's left of it. There was an embalming house for Apis bulls here. And at nearby Saqqara, which we will be visiting later today, we will see where they were interred. So right here, this big, beautiful statue, you can see three figures. All right, over here, you could probably tell it's the cat goddess Sekhmet, right? Here we have the god Ta. You can tell by the way he's standing. And here we have Ramses II himself coming, being represented as Nefertem. This is probably one of his early statues. This is a stela erected by the pharaoh Wahibre Haibre of the 6th century BCE, known as Apris by the Greeks and Hophra in the Bible. The stela describes the dedication of land, serfs, and produce to the Temple of Ptah. It was found in the ruins of the temple. Okay, so this is another statue of Meritamun, who we met yesterday as well. Um, I love how this one's a little bit smaller and we can look at the details a little bit more. If you come closer, we can see this beautiful crown. Um, there are the cobras here and these earrings, these very round earrings, these, uh, these, these uh, represent the sun. And if you look closer here, you can also see her hair and just the amazing, beautiful, um, um, intricate details. It's just such a beautiful statue. And I think she was such an interesting person. <laughs> Check this out. This is a giant sphinx made of alabaster. And it's in the guise of Hatshepsut, the famous queen uh, from the 18th dynasty. Uh, isn't it fantastic? And it's a guardian of this section of the city. It is also possible the Sphinx depicts Amenhotep II or III. We're basically judging by facial features since there are no inscriptions. But whatever the case, it was taken by Ramses II and placed here as part of his addition to the temple. The name of the stone type, from a construction perspective, is alabaster. But geologists would tell you that it is made of calcite. It is the largest known calcite statue from ancient Egypt. Palm trees are in abundance here, and you will sometimes see palm climbers. It's an inherited career. They climb the trees twice a year, once to chop and clean the fronds, and the second time to harvest the dates. The practice has changed very little since ancient times. Ehab's cousin works one of the souvenir stands at the site. He invited us over for some tea. One with sugar, one without sugar. Okay, one minute, it's no sugar. Okay, oh, well, I don't, need, I don't need sugar. That's I okay. give me one second. Thank you. Sure? Yeah, okay. Okay. You okay. You okay. This has no They're sugar. giving us tea. That's no sugar. Okay. No sugar. Stone handmade in Memphis. This one, same stone, this one. 
Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Alabaster. Local yeah. material and water and change color. Yeah. Yes. Look, this mumia Anubis. If you come to Mitrahina Museum, you have to come to number 11 yeah. and buy something from Omar. 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 Mahmoud, yeah. my father Omar. Yeah. Okay. We decided to get a bite to eat before venturing into Saqqara. So we stopped at a falafel stand on the street. Oh, look at that. Hey, oh, wow, look at this stuff. I'll take one of those, yeah. <laughs> okay, one or two, you know. Falafel, yeah. The food was amazing. Then we stopped next door to get our first taste of a sugar cane drink. They made it fresh on the spot. You gonna see the sugar cane? That's how they do it. Like it go from the inside here, like the stick go from here, come out like that from the other side, and you squeeze it, get the juice. Fresh, fresh. Oh! Ah. Wow! Do you want to try? Yeah! Okay, this is I guess I didn't need to get this, but... It's so good. This, this actually tastes like a milkshake. It tastes amazing. There were many necropolises of Memphis. Or perhaps I should say, one large one. The cemeteries can be found at Abu Rawash, Giza, Zawiyat el Aryan, Abu Ghorab, Abu Sir, Saqqara, and Dashur. More than 38 pyramids can be found in these places, not to mention more than 9,000 rock cut tombs. And you know what that means? It means there's a lot for people like us to go and see. But this day, we go to one of the very best areas, Saqqara. There we will find out about the origins of pyramid building. And we will venture into the heart of many tombs, including pyramids. Saqqara is full of tombs, and in fact, there are more being found there all the time. Ihab jokes that he could go almost anywhere at the site and dig down, and he would make an amazing discovery. That's how many ancient tombs are there. Our eyes popped as we saw for the first time the Stepped Pyramid of Saqqara. It was built for an ancient Egyptian king by the name of Netjeriket of the Third Dynasty around the 27th century. Yeah, 27th century BCE. He is more popularly known as Djoser, but this name does not appear on any of his monuments. It appears in inscriptions about him hundreds of years later. This amazing monument is located within a great funerary complex surrounded by a wall. It can be accessed through a colonnaded entrance hall, which has been partly reconstructed for visitors. To get into Saqqara costs 180 Egyptian pounds, but there are extra fees for entry into some of the best attractions. So we recommend getting the all-inclusive ticket, which costs 440 Egyptian pounds. That is roughly 1430 in US money. If you want to see everything, it will take you at least one full day. Oh my gosh! Oh, it looks great! Put your hand and touch. That's how everything as a limestone used to be. Oh yeah, this is like the new... Like that. And it looks gold. Goldy, okay. beautiful. more shiny than this. And when the sun reflects, 
and from far away you see a totally piece of gold standing. Mm -hmm. The entry portal has a ceiling made to look as if it were made of whole tree trunks. It's interesting because it probably is a stone imitation of a type of wooden ceiling that was used in those days. It's a little bit like a plastic. Yeah. But it, before they used to have like type of glue, like white glue, they get it from out of the trees and stuff. Ahab was just telling us that they used to use this glue uh, as a fine layer to put on here to make this shiny. This long hall is flanked by 20 pairs of stone columns made to look like bundles of papyrus reeds or palm branches. Stone, again, is being used here to imitate organic materials. At each end of the colonnade are stone imitations of wooden doors. They are non-functional and immovable, eternally inviting visitors to enter. Back in these early days when they were just, just working with pillars, they hadn't yet figured out how to do it so that they only needed to use the pillar. They made these walls to kind of hold them up. In the last episode, I mentioned that early Egyptian columns were usually unadorned and in a single rectangular block. But these early columns are made in sections. Nevertheless, they are primitive in their own way. Columns supported by a wall are called engaged columns. Freestanding columns will be used in the fourth dynasty, but in single pieces, to ensure they would not collapse. Most of the real roof is no longer here, and a modern cover slightly higher than the original roof, is now in place. But some of the columns that still have their tops preserved will give you an indication of the original height of the ceiling. That is the original height of this uh, structure. The construction of Djoser's funerary complex was placed under the supervision of his vizier and architect, Imhotep. By all accounts, a polymath and a genius. He designed the complex to be surrounded by a wall of limestone from Tura Quarry, 10 meters high. It had the distinctive early Egyptian palace facade, which imitated bound bundles of reeds that we have found in early dynastic funerary enclosures. Although made of stone, it imitated mud brick. How amazing is this? It's so unbelievable, so, so isn't it? If you look at this side of the wall here, you can... Uh, if... Djoser's stepped pyramid is the earliest known large-scale stone construction in history. Technically, it's not a pyramid. This is an actual pyramid. And buildings of this design in the ancient world are very rare. Egypt was the pioneer of pyramid building. But because we know this structure here represents a stage in the development towards Egyptian pyramid design, it is in fact a proto-pyramid, it has been commonly called a pyramid, or at least a stepped or step pyramid. But it really isn't a pyramid, at least not in the geometric sense. Why am I even saying this? Well, after this got called a step pyramid, people started calling similar buildings around the world step pyramids, even ones with more than four sides. In fact, nowadays, any building that is bigger on the bottom and smaller on the top is often called a pyramid. And then some people have run with this and suppose that all buildings that modern people call pyramids must be related to each other. But the pyramids you will find in Egypt are unique to Egypt. It's so fantastic to be here and witness the beginning of pyramid design, right? This is a maybe an embellished Mastaba tomb, but uh, it will lead to the true pyramid that we will see a little bit later. When we first walked out here and saw this, our jaws just dropped. And I think it's hard to not be overwhelmed when you see it for the first time. Yeah. But when you're in the, standing in the presence of it, it seems more massive it than is. when you see it on it's TV. It's incredible. It, even the ancient Egyptians, you're thinking about like what they would think when they yeah. saw this. They would never seen big buildings before. Yeah. You know? Or the foreigners coming to visit here, they would have come to Egypt and just been completely overwhelmed. We are walking through the South Court, in which the king would have made formal appearances while still alive. He would, for example, have performed rituals of his Hebzed festival here. The festival, at least in later times, was celebrated once the king had reigned 30 years as a way to renew his powers. It doesn't look like Djoser reigned that long, so he may never have performed those rituals here. There are two pairs of these crescent-shaped stones in the court, 
and they are boundary markers representing Egypt's northern and southern borders. Later art depicts the king of Egypt running around them as part of the Hebsed festival, apparently showing his control over the whole country. There's a smaller Hebsed court off to the right, which the king was expected to use during the afterlife to reenact the ritual and confirm his kingship for all eternity. Before Djoser's reign, the customary form of grave, even for kings, was the Mastaba tomb. The deceased would be entombed in an underground complex, and then a rectangular covering made of mud bricks would be constructed. Why Imhotep decided to do something different for his king is a mystery. But we do know that this proto-pyramid began as a square mastaba, except it was made of stone rather than mud bricks. But then, when Djoser's family wanted their tombs beside Djoser, Imhotep lengthened the monument into a rectangular form in order to cover the shafts used for the family. Then Imhotep placed a smaller mastaba covering on top of that, another smaller one on top of that, and a third. Later he extended the structure outwards to make it larger and added two more steps. The proto-pyramid of Djoser, which was clad in polished limestone that glistened in the sun, making it look like gold, ended up being 204 feet 62 meters high. The earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and the tallest building in the world at that time that we know of. Djoser not only put his own name on the monument, but he broke precedent and decided to honor Imhotep by having his name carved on the monument too. Perhaps this is what led to an Imhotep cult that developed in later times. We are looking below the base of the pyramid. Remember, the early tombs were always below ground level, and that is Djoser's burial vault, encased in granite blocks. The, the sarcophagus of Djoser was inside of that. Yeah. Yeah, in, but and inside can, the, the stone. The stone. Yeah. And you can see the, the double crown here. Mm -hmm. So it means his head was here, and the leg on the other side. Ah, yes. The passageway to this chamber was sealed with a granite plug. Welcome to the tomb of Djoser. There are numerous passageways and rooms used for ceremonial purposes in the subterranean complex. They were adorned with fine reliefs and blue faience tiles, which were intended to mimic the matted curtains of the royal palace in Memphis. A maze was also incorporated into the design in an attempt to foil potential tomb robbers. It didn't work. Much was stolen from here, probably in ancient times. Even his mummy was taken, though archaeologists did find part of Djoser's mummified left foot and a few valuables the thieves overlooked. A large statue of Djoser was found in here, which is now in the Cairo Museum. It is the oldest life-sized statue found so far in Egypt. All indications are that Djoser was the founder of the Old Kingdom. That is, he successfully united all of Egypt under his rule. He also appears to be the first king to have been worshipped as a god. There's a great deal of uncertainty about his ancestry, but it may be that he was the son of an earlier king, Kazakhemwi. Djoser had two daughters and no known sons. Wait, see those beams up there? One, Some of the original beams. On the other side. One of the more interesting finds from the tomb complex 
was a huge number of stone vessels, over 40,000 of them, which were in various shapes and forms and made of many different types of stone, such as limestone, slate, diorite, alabaster, and siltstone. And names of kings from before Djoser's time were found on them, kings of the first and second dynasties, as well as of apparently important non-royal persons. They were piled into the shafts. The bases, not the persons. There is debate about why the vessels were put there. Some think they were originally stored by Kazakemwi, and Djoser decided to give them a proper interment. Others think they were dumped into the shafts to prevent grave robbers from getting into the king's chamber. I have heard some people express disbelief that the Egyptians could have made so many stone vessels in the early dynastic period. But let's do the math. The first two dynasties covered a period of about 300 years. If we assume even only 10 workshops in operation in all of Egypt, that would mean each workshop produced a minimum of 13 vessels per year. One craftsman could have accomplished that, and workshops with several craftsmen would have produced far more. Remember, stone vessels were luxury goods for the wealthy. They didn't need to produce them in the thousands each year. Regular folks had cheap ceramics. You're looking at the cenotaph of the southern court with a line of cobras. The stylized upright Egyptian cobra called a uraeus symbolized sovereignty and divine authority. There's a deep burial shaft with a granite crypt here as well, commonly called the southern tomb. Have you ever wondered why shafts are sometimes vertical instead of on a slope? See this shaft down here? In order to get heavy objects down into these places, they would fill them with sand, put the heavy object on top, and then from underneath, they would pull the sand out and it would lower the object slowly down to the ground. There is a suite of rooms below with inscriptions bearing the name of Djoser. Why there is a second tomb for Djoser no one really knows for sure. Could this be a symbolic tomb used as part of the Hebsed festival ritual? Possibly. Also at Saqqara are some actual pyramids, or the remains of them. This gives us an opportunity to see how royal tomb construction has progressed over the next two or three centuries. Here we are walking up the partially restored causeway of King Unas, to enter the ruins of his funerary complex, known as Nefer Asut Unas, which means beautiful are the places of Unas. The causeway was originally enclosed. Its walls were decorated with painted reliefs, only a handful of which still can be seen, and a narrow slit in the ceiling illuminated the walls. Unas was the final ruler of the fifth dynasty during the time of the Old Kingdom. He succeeded Jedkara Isesi, and reigned at least 14 years, but possibly as many as 33. We're, we're here in the, uh, the temple that was attached to the Pyramid of Unas right there uh, from the fifth dynasty, and we're gonna be going into the pyramid. There's not much left of it, of course, because uh, people have been plundering from it, uh, but we can still go inside. No one knows what kind of ghosts haunt this area. <gasps> oh, <laughs> we're looking here at the original pavement the floor that was used uh, for the temple. It's pretty cool. There's not much left, but we've got a little bit. So here we are at the Pyramid of Unas right behind me. This was built during the fifth dynasty and it's actually the first example of the pyramid text. So we're gonna go inside and take a look. Unas reigned during a period of economic decline. So he did not have as much money to pour into his funerary complex as others. This pyramid is smaller than that of Djoser. It once rose to a height of 141 feet, or 43 meters. But it was a true pyramid, although it was not Egypt's first true pyramid. We will see that one later in the trip. The core masonry consisted of accreted blocks encased in fine limestone. You can still see some of the original uh, casing stones on the pyramid here, and here they are. Uh, these ones here, don't pay them, no mind, that's the uh, reconstruction, but this is the original. And up there at the top, you can see some of the original writing. And you're like, writing? On the outside of a pyramid? Yes, those hieroglyphs there, it's unusual, but on the Unas pyramid, they had them. Mm -hmm. See at the very, very top, 
you can see two cartouches there with the names of the king. Although there were several royal pyramids constructed between Djoser's and this one, this is the first one since then to contain decorated walls, and these are more elaborately decorated than Djoser's. Oh, there's a picture of the of the king. Yes. So here we are inside the incredible burial chamber of the Pyramid of Unas. And you can see all these amazing details on the walls. This is actually the first example of the pyramid text in, in Egypt. And, and you can see them all along here. Um, I think this is the cartouche here of uh, Unas. And if you look at the ceiling, you'll see all these stars. And that represents the, the goddess Nut, who is sort of watching over everything. Um, and if you look closely on the walls as well, you can see remnants of blue paint, which is one of my personal favorite details. All the rooms were built with fine limestone, except for the west wall of the burial chamber and the western halves of the adjoining walls, which were made of alabaster. The burial chamber was decorated to be a microcosm of the known universe. The ceiling is painted with golden stars in a dark blue night sky representing the place where Unas was expected to go. His stone coffin, representing the fertile earth, is made from grey wacker, not basalt as was previously presumed. When discovered by archaeologists, the contents had been robbed, but a mummified left arm and hand, as well as pieces of skull, were found in the debris. The pyramid texts are a collection of spells and formulas meant to protect and guide the spirits of the king in the afterlife. Previous kings may have had such spells recited orally for them, or put into their tombs on papyrus documents, but those of Unas are the oldest to have survived, and that's because he made the choice to have them inscribed on the stone walls. They were meticulously carved in vertical columns and painted blue. They are arranged in an order that indicates they were meant to be read first near the sarcophagus, then heading out towards the door, then to the antechamber, and then through the pyramid corridor. This indicates they expected the Ba, one of the spirits of the king, the one representing his personality, to be the one reading the formulas as it exited his body and made its way to join the gods in the sky. The cult of Osiris was becoming more popular at the time of Unas, while the cult of Ra seems to have lost some of its popularity. Osiris represented kings after death, the trend of building sun temples dedicated to Ra, which had been done by earlier kings of the 5th dynasty, no longer is in fashion. But the pyramid texts found in Unas's pyramid demonstrate the importance of both Osiris and Ra in ancient Egyptian religion at the time. In the antechamber, we see these words. Unas is as that which dawns, which dawns, which endures, which endures. Speaking of the sun, of course. The doers of evil shall not be able to destroy the favorite place of Unas, among the living in this land forever and ever. This spell was intended to protect his favorite place, this tomb, from destruction, but sadly we can see the spell did not work as well as Unas would have wished. It's very low down here. <laughs> A 
Although this episode has come to an end, our day at Saqqara is not over, my friends. We have more, much more to see. In our next episode, we will be descending into the depths of the great Serapium of Saqqara, one of the highlights of this place. In it are the gigantic stone sarcophagi that you will sometimes hear people making amazing claims about. Who made these artifacts? And what were they for? When were they made? And when was this vast complex first hollowed out? Tune in to see us unravel the mystery of the origins of the Serapium. And don't forget to subscribe.